Good evening, everybody. My name is Stephen Wolfolk. I'm the Director of Programming and Marketing at the Kansas City Public Library. Uh, before we get started tonight, I wanted to mention uh, uh, quickly two upcoming events next week. Um, first of all, next Wednesday, back here at the Plaza Branch, we will have Eileen Zimmerman for a discussion of her new book, Smacked, a story of white collar ambition, addiction, and tragedy. Um, Eileen and, and her uh, ex-husband Peter were divorced, but they remained uh, friends and partners in raising their children. When she mentioned that he didn't look well, he told her that he had an autoimmune deficiency. When she noticed that he was behaving oddly, she wrote it off as stress and overwork. Until one day that she and the children couldn't get a hold of him, she went over to uh, check on him and found out that he had overdosed. She set out to understand uh, how a man she had known for nearly 30 years had become addicted to pills, synthetic opioids, cocaine, and eventually methamphetamine, and how neither she nor any of his friends or colleagues suspected uh, what was happening. And the book uh, is a, a really, really good book, a really touching book that chronicles that, uh, that journey for her to understand. Uh, then next Thursday at our central uh, library downtown, uh, we'll host uh, Jeannie Venasco for a discussion of her book, Things We Didn't Talk About When I Was a Girl. Um, I'm going to be honest with you, this was a difficult book to read, um, and it will probably be a difficult presentation to hear, but as uh, hard as the topic can be, it's also an, an important one, and her message is an important one. Uh, when Venasco was 19, she was raped by one of her best friends. Fourteen years later, she was still suffering from the events of that night. She had nightmares. She struggled to deal with her emotions. She didn't understand why she didn't have stronger emotions. And she felt she needed to understand why it happened and whether he felt any remorse. So she reached out to him. And in her book, she chronicles their conversations. She parses his words and her own, and she processes her emotions. Most importantly, she seeks to answer the question that had been plaguing her all those years, is it possible to be a good person who commits a terrible act? So we hope to see you back for, uh, for one or both of those. They'll, they'll both be um, very good events, both very good books. Um, tonight, though, we're covering another timely and important topic, and one we've been looking to touch on for a while now. In his new book, What's Your Pronoun? Beyond He and She, Dr. Dennis Barron declares that pronouns are suddenly sexy, or more specifically, that pronouns without sex are suddenly sexy. I can't believe I managed to say that on the first try. <laughs> um, but while the, the, um, there's a perception that the idea of gender neutral pronouns is a new one, that it was born alongside trigger warnings, safe spaces, and gender neutral bathrooms. But while the notion of gender neutral pronouns has certainly received more attention of late, the idea has been around for centuries. Barron chronicles the role that they have played and continue to play in establishing both our rights and our identities. And he offers a tour of the history of pronouns that will appeal to students of both grammar and history. And there's a lot of history here, far more than I would have thought, far more than you might expect. From Than to Heesh to Hizir, back to Than, to G back to Heesh, to Het and Z and Here. But the best solution, Baron says, might just be one that predates all of those. The singular they, used by Shakespeare and others. Barron is a research professor of English and linguistics at the University of Illinois. He's the author of the blog, The Web of Language, and is a frequent guest on radio and television to discuss the English language and the digital revolution. His previous book, A Better Pencil, Readers, Writers, and the Digital Revolution, traces the impact of communication technologies on our reading and writing practices. He's here tonight to discuss his newest book, What's Your Pronoun, Beyond He and She, it's available for sale in the lobby, courtesy of our friends of the library. He's joined this evening by C.J. Janovey. C.J. is KCUR's digital managing editor, the author of No Place Like Home, Lessons in Activism from LGBT Kansas, and a good friend of the Kansas City Public Library. Please welcome C.J. Janovey and Dr. Dennis Barron. everyone. Hi. Hello. And uh, this is Dennis Barron's first visit to Kansas City, so let's, uh, let's give him... But I do know what state it's in. <laughs> Good. Already off to a great start there. 
Um, I have many questions for Dennis, um, but I just want to say a couple things. First of all, I'm, I'm uh, CJ. I identify as she and her, and um, I'm actually really happy that this has become a thing where we say what our prono pronouns are. I, uh, for many years, was the editor of the Pitch newspaper, and um, every May, when students were gra graduating, especially journalism school graduates, I would get letters from young journalists who wanted jobs, and you would be shocked at how many of these letters were addressed to Mr. Janovey mm -hmm. from journalists. And uh, I, was, I was shocked at their inability to just do a web search, but, um, you know. <laughs> Now, if they did that, they would find my Twitter handle where it says she, her. So, um, so just that's my personal story about my own pronouns. And, um, and I, I want to just, do, do you want to add anything before we get going? Or just, should I just dive into the questions here? I'm going to dive into the questions. Okay. Um, so, um, Actually, no, so, I, so before I do that, I have questions for you guys. I'm interested to know how many of you are, uh, identify as uh, he, him, his? Okay, um, very good. Uh, she, her? Okay, very good. They, them? Excellent. Uh, any other, like, so other non-binary pronouns? Okay, okay, got a couple hands up. Who does not want to be asked this question ever? Okay, <laughs> all right. So, uh, so we've got a range of folks. Does anybody not want any pronouns at all? Because that is also an option. There are people who say, no pronouns for me, please. Please, no pronouns. Okay, thank you for identifying yourselves. Um, as Stephen said, this, this, um, this topic goes back, th this is not a new topic, this goes back centuries. And I'm probably going to, uh, I've, got, I've got lots of, of uh, post-it notes here on the books, book where things really jumped out at me and I, and I just want to read a passage that goes, I'm going to start by reading a passage that goes back to 17... 92, and it involves a, a Scottish philosopher named James Anderson, who, uh, so he's a philosopher, he's, he wants to better reflect the sexual diversity he finds in the world around him. And so he decides English grammar would be better off with 13 grammatical genders instead of two or three. This is 1792. Among the categories that Anderson created, a separate gender to refer to castrated animals, another for men and castrated men, yet another for females and castrata, another for males and inanimates, and just to be fair, another for females and inanimates. He also found it inconvenient that the feminine her had to do double duty as both object and possessive, while the masculine used only the distinct forms him and his. Finally, Anderson proposed not just one, but two indefinite plurals to take the place of they. Anderson was a thinker, not a doer. <laughs> Confining most of his writing to economics and philosophy, he didn't actually coin any new pronouns to go with his new gender categories. Fortunately for us, his recommendations for 13 third-person plural pronouns far too complicated for any grammar, were largely ignored. What happened next? <laughs> well, what, what seems to be in the air, and what may have prompted Anderson to go overboard with 13 genders, was a sense that there's a word missing from English, that there is no third person singular hope that's not too technical, third person singular pronoun that means he or she, and today we would add, or someone who's non-binary. They were thinking, back in the 18th century, the, 
the discussion was basically binary then. They were looking for a word that would include both men and women. Uh, there was a general discontent with the grammar books that recommended the generic masculine, the generic he, he includes she, she includes it. That was the, that was the lesson uh, that you learned in school back then, but, but they said, well, well, wait a minute, he does not always include she, and, and, and what about uh, those instances where we don't know what the gender is of, of the person we're talking about, or we want to hide the gender of the person that we're talking about. We need, a, we need a word, we need a missing word, and he's not doing the job, singular they, well, it's there, but too many people said, oh, it's not grammatical. You can't use a plural pronoun to mean a singular. We'll, we'll talk about that. Of course you can. But um, we are not amused. Death is said by one person. <laughs> you is a plural pronoun uh, that is used in the singular, started being used in the singular in the 17th century. Right before that, we had thou and thee, thou and thy, and thee. Uh, we don't say that anymore. We don't use the th forms except to sort of evoke Shakespeare or the Bible to sound old-fashioned, to be funny, to be cute. Uh, so you started being singular. People objected. You can't use a plural pronoun for singular. What you know? Is it? Is it? Is it fair then to, so, so English, English language scholars, grammarians, people who are interested in the English language, is it fair to sort of suggest that, that they might be ahead of, ahead of their time with, with, with the politics of today? I mean, were, they, were these people thinking more inclusively in general because they were thinking about this particular problem in the English language? They weren't particularly woke. Uh. <laughs> Their concern, I mean, initially, back in the later 18th century, their, their concern was basically grammatical correctness. We don't want to make a mistake in grammar. You know, a pronoun is supposed to agree with the word that it refers to. We call it its referent in gender and in number. The generic masculine agrees in number with, you know, everybody forgets his Passwords that agrees that everybody is singular and he is singular, but doesn't agree in gender. And a lot of people said, well, uh, generic he is simply ungrammatical. Uh, everybody forgets their password. Well, that agrees in gender because they is gender neutral, but it's plural. So that's ungrammatical. So what do you do? Make up a word. We need a word. Lots of people made up words, and people started. I, I got a word. They would say, "You have I, a whole sort of chronology of this in in the end of the book, or toward the end of the book. There's there's a, lots of different made up words, and you trace many of them and why they didn't take off, or mm -hmm. or uh, uh, the debates about them. And I I would say so the you can trace this debate to like. Articles in newspapers in small towns all across the country, letters to the editor in newspapers. Mm -hmm. and, and it's fascinating. I mean, it, this really sort of cranks up in the, in the mid-1800s, would you say? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I found over 200 coined pronouns. I mean, Anderson had only 13 genders, but I found over 200 suggestions for filling in that blank, filling in that missing word. And they weren't all created by cranks and crackpots. Some of them were created by, were coined by very well-known, highly educated, well-respected people. So uh, the earliest coined pronoun I found, 1841, which is about 50 years after the debate started, and there must be people who had coined them during that 50 year period. I just haven't found them yet. 1841, Francis Augustus Brewster, who had just gotten his MD from Yale in 1840, 
Apparently practicing medicine wasn't doing it for him. So in 1841, he published an English grammar book. Oh, not a page turner, uh, I, I have, have to admit. Uh, fortunately, it wasn't very long, it was about 50 pages. And there is only one surviving copy that I've been able to determine, and that is in the Yale University Library because he gave them a copy. I don't think anybody bought his book. <laughs> but Brewster decided that for the pronouns, he was going to have what he called a masculo-feminine pronoun. E, the letter E, capitalized. E-S, S, or E-S, I don't know how he pronounced it, and M, E-S and M, were his, what we would call gender neutral or non-binary pronouns today. He used the term masculo-feminine, which is actually a Latin term for her hermaphrodite, a person who exhibits characteristics of both male and female sex. And he applied it to grammar, and uh, everybody ignored his suggestion, although E was reinvented by other people several times between 1841 and the present. Why don't you think it, I mean, why did people ignore it? This is a guy of some stature. I don't know, they didn't catch on. They didn't have much traction, these, these pronouns. In 1884, Charles C. Converse, who was a well-known American hymn writer, nationally known, celebrated. He is the author of, he's the composer of What a Friend We Have in Jesus, and many other hymns, decided we needed a new pronoun. And he proposed thon, T-H-O-N, which he announced in a, in a literary journal in 1884, was a blend of that and one. He even told us how to pronounce it, thon. A lot of these coiners didn't say how to pronounce the word. So because he was well known, this sparked a national discussion about pronouns. Some people said, hey, that sounds like a great idea. I'm gonna use thon. He got recommendations from the president of Rutgers, from a major uh, philologist at Harvard. Uh, his pronoun thon got included in Webster's New International Dictionary in 1934. This was, you know, a good 50 years after he announced it. He claimed he coined it in 1858, but he didn't announce it to the world till 1884. But in terms of the national discussion that followed this announcement, other people said, I don't like thon, we need a word. I got a better idea. And somebody suggested le, L-E, from the French, regardless of the fact that le is a masculine article in French. This was supposed to be a gender neutral pronoun in English. Somebody else suggested ip, I-P, ip, which is my favorite coinage because it is so darn cute. Uh, Wait, can you use it in a sentence? Uh, everybody forgets Ips passwords. Uh, it didn't catch on. Uh, <laughs> 1912, Ella Flagg Young, who was the first woman superintendent of the Chicago Public Schools, announced at a meeting of school superintendents that she had coined here, hisser, and himmer. And she wanted the principals to go back to their schools and tell the staff to use them, to use these pronouns. So here is a major educator in, in the US, a pioneer woman who was superintendent of schools. She was uh, the first woman president of the National Education Association. After she was done uh, running the Chicago schools, she got her doctorate at the University of Chicago studying under John Dewey. So she was, she was wired into sort of the American intellectual scene and she recommended here, his, her, and himmer. And the next year, this was 1912, the next year Isaac Funk put, it, put here, his, her, and himmer 
in his in the newest edition of his Funk and Wagnalls encyclopedia. So you can look it up in your Funk and Wagnalls if you remember that. It turns out that Ella Young may have plagiarized that pronoun because in 1911 her friend Fred Pond, also of Chicago, had published suggestions in two Ohio newspapers and letters to the editor for Hear, Hisser, and Himmer. And after somebody asked her, asked Ella Young about this, she said, well, yeah, Fred and I did talk about it, and we came to it together. So she didn't make it up on the way to the principal's meeting, and she probably didn't collaborate with Fred Pond. She just said, oh, that's a good idea, Fred. Let me, let me, let me run with that. You, this time that you're describing, I mean, obviously this is, people are really thinking about this, and um, um, this jumps, you're talking about the 1920s by now. Mm -hmm. um, I want to jump back a little bit, just to the 1900 in the Baltimore Sun, you have, you have an excerpt from, uh, from an article uh, actually, is 93. Proposing a new gender is the name of this uh, article. It was the headline for this article, so I'm just going to read a little bit about what the, what the Baltimore Sun had to say about this debate in 1900. Not so many years ago, the need for a new pr pronoun was not pressing. The word American, for example, then meant a male citizen only. An American woman was called an American woman. But there were, no f there, there were then no female wrestlers or male milliners. But today, the old barriers of sex grow shadowy and faint. Women are taking the citadel of the decadent, sterner sex by storm. Already, the female barber, baseball player, anarchist, theologian, and horse trainer are commonplace and the men grow feminine as the dear girls grow masculine. The Chicago women's clubs demand that all schoolboys be taught plain sewing and home cooking. Men eat chocolates, patronize <laughs> manicures, go to matinees. Thus, Vaughn seems to meet a growing want. Perhaps it might be well, while the subject is under discussion, to attempt to create an entirely new gender for the purpose of facilitating reference to the growing caste of manly women and womenly men. <laughs> so, one thing I... <laughs> this is no. not a serious proposal. This is satirical. But you can see that, you know, what, what the thinking is here is that gender is becoming confusing. The gender roles ain't what they used to be. And we are responding to this. In, the, in this case, with satire, but some people were quite, quite serious about, you know, how, how can we use language to indicate the changing roles of the genders in American society? And so you got people, you have people taking it really seriously, but then you have this this growing backlash. And mm -hmm. I, I feel like reading reading your uh, reading your book, you really see that intensify with the second wave of feminism mm -hmm. into the 19, 1970s. Um, can you talk about a little bit about that? Well, I mean, we can we can even go back to the first wave of of feminism, the the post Seneca Falls uh, discussion, because there was a lot of pushback from uh, more conservative Americans about uh, the role, uh, the increasing uh, presence of women in public roles in the US and there was resistance to it. And so you would get comments like, well, if you really want a new pronoun, then it's the job of these new women suffragists to create one, okay? Or if they didn't like the suggestions, they blamed the suffragists for changes in the language Bad enough, they were changing gender roles in society. They were also impacting the language. And, and so it was a no-win situation. The suffragists were blamed for not coming up with the right word or for using a word that, nobody, that, that the critic didn't want them to use. 
the, the um, editor of Harper's Magazine, who was violently anti-woman, said basically, you know, by the by the if women are are, are entering these roles in the numbers that that they want to to see and and changing all our, our all you know what what men and women are supposed to do it's nobody's going to care about pronouns because the whole you know the life as we know it is going to fall apart well, I, mean, I think that civilization <laughs> western civilization is is you know going to ruin by all these feminists and and we weren't pronouns you know nobody's going to care about pronouns because we'll all be dead i mean <laughs> now it's climate change but 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 then it was you know it was feminism but that same sort of sort of um, <laughs> condescension or derision or or like really hostility oh, toward yeah. toward this idea that people are changing, life is changing, and, and, and the, the, the people who have sort of held power over official language are, are not receptive. Yeah, but, but okay, so, but, but there were plenty of guys who were supportive of, of suffrage, of women's suffrage, uh, in, in, uh, in England, uh, a number of male members of parliament, because there were no female members of parliament at the time, uh, tabled suffrage bills and tried to, tried to uh, get suffrage laws passed, tried to get the voting laws amended uh, so that they would not be exclusively male, uh, recommended uh, more inclusive pronoun usage in both England and the U.S., so so you know, it wasn't the the guy the the men were not always on the wrong side, here and there were many women who were who who opposed the the feminists of of the day as well. So so it wasn't quite as neat a distinction as as these comments seem to seemed to indicate, but it, it was basically uh, a pushback against feminism. You, I mean, this idea of, of f f government bodies trying to do the right thing, and you write that in November 1974, California voters passed Proposition 11, a referendum amending the state constitution to make its language gender neutral. Gender neutral language in the, in the state constitution of California. Voters approve this. Uh, but a, a, a guy named John Abraham of Fullerton writes a letter to the editor in response. Uh, he has a different, he has a proposal for this gender neutral language, which is, uh, he suggests combining she, he, and it. In, in well, a way you, that you're, is you're, slightly you're, scatological. Your obvious recognition of how this sounds means that maybe I don't need to go ahead and pronounce it here from the stage of the Kansas City Public Library, but um, she is. Uh, it's a family yeah. library. Yes. <laughs> um, but uh, you could say yeah. it in the newspaper, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. And um, so, so there were some of that push back to, but what a lot of, it's interesting because a lot of states did rewrite their constitutions and their statutes to make them gender neutral after the 1970s when there was a push for more gender neutral language across the board, more inclusive language. And the solution that they typically found, the states that did this, was to ditch pronouns all together and to simply repeat the noun. So if you're describing the office and the duties of the governor, every time you come to a reference to the governor, instead of saying he or she, or instead of alternating he and she, uh, it would just repeat the governor. The governor this, the governor that, the governor. It, it, 
It sounds a little redundant. I mean, you wouldn't want to put this in a novel, maybe, because it interrupts the flow of language. But for legal language, which has different requirements, and, and you want to make sure it's, it's as clear as possible to avoid the many lawsuits that you know are going to spring up from somebody who doesn't like the, the new language anyway. Uh, this, this is the solution. You just avoid pronouns. You can rewrite in the plural sometimes, but you know, you're only going to have one governor at a time, or one dog catcher, or whatever the, the office is. And so the idea was to just repeat the noun. Since we're talking about laws now, I, I, one of the most fascinating parts of the book, uh, and, and very powerful, I thought, was your, your discussion of how uh, pronouns really became, became legal weapons. Mm -hmm. Can you uh, give us a few examples of that? OK. so. In 1850 in England, in 1867 in Canada, and in 1871 in the US, the legislatures passed a, a statute which was supposed to apply to all the other statutes, a defining statute. And there was a paragraph in each of those, in each of those countries which said basically, if a word in a law refers to a man, it also includes women. Okay, so every time there's a pronoun he, that means she as well. Okay, he, he means he or she. So it was a way of, of reinterpreting the law so that every time you wrote a law, you wouldn't have to say he or she or repeat the governor, the governor, the governor. Okay. So, suffragists seized on this generic masculine and fielded this, an argument that goes something like this. If he, in the criminal law, includes she, and a woman who commits a crime can be punished even though the law refers to the lawbreaker as he, then he, in the voting law, if we're going to be consistent, means that women can vote. Right? Susan B. Anthony basically said in 1872 at, at a suffragist rally in Illinois, we've got to be consistent, we've got to be fair. If you're going to, if you're going to deny that, if you're going to say women can't vote even though the law says he, and the law, 1871 in the US, the year before, said that if he occurs in the law, that means she as well. So she said, if you're not going to honor that, then if a woman commits murder, let her husband hang for it. <laughs> not such a bad idea. <laughs> However, Judges and legislators, and at the time they were all men, said, I don't think so. <laughs> and the legal thinking, both in England and the US and in Canada, was that when a law covered a, an obligation or a penalty, like paying tax or going to jail, then he includes she. But when it refers to a right, like voting or becoming a doctor or a lawyer, then he means he. And it can't mean she unless the, a new law is passed specifically conferring that right to women. And so, for example, when the 19th Amendment is passed, there are no pronouns in the 19th Amendment. There's no reference to male or female as the right to vote shall not be denied on the basis of sex. That's how they got around the pronoun issue. Avoid it. So, we're st so flash forward to today yes. and the ways in which pronouns are still uh, causing problems in the legal system for folks. Okay. So, um, in 1841, flashing back just for a second, we'll get to today. <laughs> Two American abolitionists, both male, Lysander Spooner and Wendell Phillips, got into an argument in the press 
about whether he, in the Constitution, in Article 2, which describes the qualifications and the duties of the president, whether he meant a woman couldn't be president. And Lysander Spooner said, it says he in the Constitution, it doesn't say she. There's no women mentioned in the Constitution. Woman can't be president. And Wendell Phillips said, but wait a minute. Take the Fifth Amendment. The Fifth Amendment says no person shall be forced to be a witness against himself using the masculine pronoun. But that is always interpreted as generic. It always means that women have the right to remain silent as well as men. And if a word means one thing in one part of the Constitution, it must mean exactly the same thing in every other part of the Constitution. And that's accepted constitutional interpretation. So a woman definitely can be president. When Jeanette Rankin was elected as the first woman member of the House of Representatives in 1916, a number of strict constructionists said, well, the Constitution refers to members of the House and the Senate as he, Rankin can't be seated even if she wins the election. But in fact, she had no trouble being seated. The House interpreted he as generic and it was a non-issue. But as recently as 1916, during the primaries, some crank wrote a letter to the editor saying, if Hillary Clinton gets elected, don't worry, she can't be president because the Constitution says he. Uh, at, at, and after the election, unfortunately that did not get to be tested, uh, after the election one constitutional scholar said, hey, you know, it's really time that we rewrote the Constitution to make it gender neutral. Good luck trying to do that can't even get the ERA passed. <laughs> okay. So yeah, pronouns are political. <laughs> pronouns are political, and I, and I want to jump uh, to, to uh, um, your section, Queering the Pronoun, and this, has, this, this continues to, to deal with the law a little bit, actually quite a lot, and, but I was struck by, by a line here. Um, you're, t you're talking about institutions that are, are taking up the question of how to deal with people's pronouns. And there's, there's an actual <laughs> sentence. Uh, well, we, we, you're, you're, talking about, you're talking about efforts to do this in schools, and you're talking about efforts to do this in prisons. And um, you have a sentence, schools, even more than prisons, routinely find themselves dealing with gender recognition issues. Right. And it's striking just to sort of, th the, the way that this juxtaposition to me reinforced this idea that, that the similarities between schools and prisons. Yeah, are. yeah. But the, the language issue is, is uh, foregrounded there. In, in 2017, there was a case uh, that was publicized nationally. Uh, a, a transgender fifth grade teacher in Tallahassee uh, announced to their class that their pronouns were they and them, not he or she, and wanted the students to use the title Mix, M-X, which is a gender neutral title instead of Ms. or Mr., and sent a letter home to the parents explaining this. And some of the parents got so upset that they immediately called the school, had their kids pulled from the classroom. Uh, several newspapers, national newspapers, ran stories. The uh, USA Today called this teacher the gender-neutral teacher. And Chloe Bressack was the teacher's name, was reassigned from the fifth grade classroom that they were teaching to an adult education center where Presumably, they could do a lot less harm to tender young minds. 
a lawyer from Tallahassee wrote into the local newspaper and said, you know, this teacher has no right imposing ideas about gender and confusing these kids, but as long as they're doing that, I think they should use the pronoun Z, which would be Z-I-E, which would be much less confusing than <laughs> singular they. And you know, the teacher is teaching them something that's grammatically incorrect. I don't know. People are not necessarily consistent. There is. Do I contradict myself? <laughs> Walt Whitman said yeah. very well that I can contradict myself. But you have the answer. You have the answer to this decades yes, long. Yes, the answer is, I think, the answer is turning out to be singular they. Okay, the coined pronouns, although they have a following, are not widely used, a small percentage of people use here or Z or E or per or one of the other coinages. Everybody uses singular they. Singular they has been in English since 1375 and written English. It appears in carefully edited, well-respected writers' works including Shakespeare, Jane Austen. I think there are 200 examples or more of singular they in Pride and Prejudice. Uh, people who hate singular they, the language gurus, the style specialists who go out on the public stage and say, you can't use singular they because it's ungrammatical. They use it themselves when they're not being so careful the Benjamin Dryers, the Mary Narses, they use it. And more and more of the language authorities accept it. Dictionaries, grammar books, style guides, the Associated Press is using it, the American Psychological Association. A couple of months ago in October, their new publication manual said singular they is okay, is preferable to be used both for indefinites and for known individuals, whether it's in published writing or dealing with clients, it's, it's the form to use. It's natural, it's unavoidable. People who care about gender issues use it. People who don't give a hoot about gender issues use it. It is the one-size-fits-all pronoun. After all, everyone loves their mother. Ah. <clears throat> That's your example, which I think is a great one. And, and I have to say, as a, as a professional writer, it, when the Associated Press and the, and the uh, Association of Copy Editors allowed yes. Singular They, I felt completely liberated and it, relieved uh, absolutely. and um, uh, happy yes. not to have to sort of worry about this anymore. It's, it's natural. Yeah. You got a phone call. Did they leave a message? What did they want? You don't say, what did he or she want? You don't say, what did he want? You don't say, what did she want? You don't say, what did Z want? You say, what did they want? It's the natural response. Right. I, I, we're going we're gonna, to, I think, open up to questions. And um, so there's, there's microphones for anyone who wants to uh, ask questions or, or uh, uh, say anything they want, I guess. And um, If you have a manifesto, keep it short. But yes. Quest <laughs> yeah. Questions, sir? Yeah. Um, are great. And while anyone's coming up, while they are coming up uh, to the microphone, I just sort of, my main takeaway from, from the book is just um, the, this idea that, that both gender and language are social constructs mm -hmm. on sliding scales. Mm -hmm. And I think some of us knew that, have always known that, have always... Um, experienced that, but to sort of see it uh, confirmed through this sort of historical documentation, I think is right. very valuable. Right. Language is fluid, language changes, I think will continue, even though singular they is sort of my guess as to what will march forward. I think we'll continue to have multiple solutions to the missing word issue. Hello. Uh, since you're a linguist, correct? Then you know about uh, 
a European language yes. that doesn't have gender separations? Well, uh, there's no gender in the pronoun system in Finnish or in Turkish or in Mandarin. Or Hungarian. Oh, okay, Hungarian. The finno ugaritic languages, yes? Yes. yes. Uh, in other words, but it doesn't mean m much in terms of sex. Right. It's right. just that way. R right. There's a disconnect between whether or not a language has gender in its pronouns and its nouns, and whether or not a culture is discriminatory uh, or inclusive. Uh, those things are, are, are not, you know, if we get rid of the gendered words in English, that's not going to make us one big happy family, uh, necessarily. That's uh, right. It, uh, also, the gender of a noun, which is not known in English, right. but in other languages. In other words, there are things that are different, mm -hmm. very dif some of them are very different. Yeah, it, it's, it's easy to confuse grammatical gender and biological gender. And so languages that have gender in the noun system, it's typically uh, patterns of word endings and, and, and things like that. It has nothing to do with, you know, a, t a table in French does not have biological gender, right? And, and, and just because it's feminine, in the noun system doesn't mean tables exhibit female characteristics, right? Or, or in German, you have neuter nouns. It doesn't mean that they are non-binary. You know, the table is non-binary or, or, or so I, the people I, and objects are, are just different. Excuse me. I believe this conversation, this presentation, could not have happened in Hungary, for instance, because it's no problem. She or he or somebody stuck in the cracks or actually made the transfer, what's the difference? Okay, well, that's probably why I haven't been invited to Hungary <laughs> to talk about this. <laughs> Thank you. But Sweden is a case where there's a transition because there is a gender neutral pronoun that is getting a lot of traction in Swedish, has been since the 1990s. It's hen, and it exists alongside the masculine and feminine pronouns. It's a coined pronoun. And it, it, about four years ago, was added to the official Swedish Academy Dictionary. And not everybody uses it, but it's common enough that when it's used, you don't have to explain, oh, yeah, this is the new gender-neutral pronoun, in case you aren't paying attention. So, so people know about it now. Hi, I have a question about uh, gender identity or identity pronouns. Why do we say she, her? Uh, does anyone say she, them, or she, him? Isn't it enough to say she, he, or they? Oh, you mean why do we have possessive and object forms? It's just an accident of how English developed. I mean, a lot of languages do that. Uh, they They tell you whether the noun or the pronoun is the subject or the object or, or a possessive or an indirect object. Uh, some have very complex, what we call cases for nouns and pronouns. English is fairly simple among, among the languages. It's not necessary to have it, but it, it's a feature of English. We obviously feel it's necessary enough that it's not disappearing, but we don't use the ablative in English anymore. If you want to know what it is, look it up. <laughs> if, I t if I have to explain what the ablative is, you'll all go to sleep. Uh, yes. Thank you. I, I used to teach Latin, too, so I do know what the ablative is. Yes, OK. Uh, well, you can explain <laughs> the ablative after no, when we have the some The ablative wine. absolute. But, uh, <laughs> absolute. Which is different. Uh, but anyway, thank you. I've been looking forward to uh, hearing you for a long time. And just a little background, I taught English not only regular English, you know, composition and literature, but also uh, graduate and undergraduate courses in the history of the English language and mm. structure of modern grammars for 47 years. So I know what you're talking about. Uh, one thing you're not stressed, kind of came up in your comment near the end, but is levels in English. We have the very informal level, where lots of people use things, even people who complain about it, a medium level and a more 
stricter conservative level or More formal for, level. Formal and informal, formal level, yes. Yeah. And uh, if you're going to write a research paper or a formal report for your boss or something. Mm. Um, the change here is that we want to use this go all the levels. Everyone was using that in the informal level. Mm. And they're using ain't, you know. So let me tell you this, 300 years of English teaching has not gotten eight out of, eight out of English language. Uh, um, it's going to be used in the informal level as they is. But my question is not so much for my studies in structure of grammar, but history of the English language. The English language, I think, is number one for word formation. It is absolutely brilliant, mm -hmm. based on the old German compounding and all sorts of things. We do back formation, we do all kinds of things. I noticed in your talk, the responses, you talked about this one person, this one teacher, this one abolition, this one oh, mm -hmm. whoever, uh, couldn't make Thon or <laughs> Z or whatever go. But that's the trouble, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, one person's not, language, I think, right. after 47 years of teaching, has a mind of its own. Sometimes I think it has a life. They call it a living language, and I think it is. Yes. You can't tell English what it's going to do, and that's the trouble. Why not get people together? The NCT, National Constitution of English, linguists, dictionaries, whoever we need to get together and make a new word. You know, dictionaries publish new words every year. They have a whole list of new words. They have to fill, up, fill them up. Wouldn't it be better to use the creative resources of English? Because now it seems to me this is the cheap and easy way, and I think it's going to be used, probably. I think you're right. How about the creative but hard way and make a real new word, not some of these which strike me as a little silly, but a real new word uh, people may not know this, but pronouns and prepositions are the two really solid pieces of English. They haven't changed for a long time. And, and the trouble we're in, of course, is that if you ever wanted to know what it felt like to be a speaker of Old English, Rasta se rica y mina ringmania, Beowulf mataloda. We don't want to be that way either. We want English to change. But why not use the creative resources of English to add to the language, make a new word, but don't get one person, get everyone behind it, and then we wouldn't have to have this controversy either about whether we're destroying language through um, you know, use of they. Uh, why not do that? Do you have any ideas on that? I'd be interested to hear. OK, because a committee is no more effective at doing this than an individual. And you can see that with the French Academy, for example. They're, they have not been effective in getting uh, speakers of French to avoid English borrowed words, which is one of their one of their tasks is, is to create technical terms uh, instead of borrowing them from English, create terms that, that work in French. And they have lists and lists and lists, and they are pretty much ignored. Uh, because language has a mind of its own, we can't really effectively impose language rules top down. They have to trickle up. And one of the reasons why uh, people who coin words become so frustrated is they can't convince everybody else to sign on to their word. And a committee's going to be no more effective. In the 19th century, people said, oh, let's get a group of philologists together, and they'll come up with the perfect word. You know, didn't work. Didn't work. You, you, you couldn't get a bunch of philologists in the same room to agree on a word to begin with, just as you couldn't get a group of non-specialists to agree on a word. You know, it's like the Iowa caucuses, <laughs> right? My question is purely personal in my daily life. I, um, I know a lot of people who are deciding what their pronoun is going to be. And so, and I understand the the convenience of the use of they. Mm -hmm. Everyone loves their mother. Who Did they leave a message? But my question is, if I hear from a friend that they are coming to dinner, I don't know how many people I'm going to feed. <laughs> so that's the confusion I have it with it when I bring it up to my friends who are, for whom this conversation is very actively personally important. They find me flippant and politically incorrect, but I, I'm confused by the plurality of the use okay, of that. So language can be ambiguous. It's ambiguity, is, uh, uncertainty is built in to our communication system. And every time there is an ambiguity, every time you don't understand something. Here's the example I, I use in class. 
you go to the grocery store and you see all these people holding shopping lists or the list is on their phone. And the shopping list was made up by somebody else and said, here, as long as you're going to the store, get this. And they are now constantly on the phone checking to see what bread means, what milk means. Spaghetti sauce? Do you know how many kinds of spaghetti sauce there are in front of me? Each brand has 36 different kinds. You know, could you please? So we have ways of disambiguating. We have ways of figuring out. You is plural. You is singular. Are you talking to me? Are you talking to us? We have ways of dealing with that. One of the ways that the second person deals with ambiguity, at least in spoken language, is by creating clearly plural forms of you, like y'all, like use, where I come from in New York City, use, hey, use. <laughs> or in the Midwest, yins, right? Or the sort of non-geographical you guys, you said you guys, when you ask people what their pronouns were. Even though guys is potentially gender-marked masculine, and some people object to that, other people sort of treat it as, as a neutral form. We have ways of disambiguating. So I don't see that they is any more of a problem, singular plural, than you is, is, is a problem. And even y'all in the South when it started being used for an individual rather than a group, there's nobody else here except you, and you're calling me y'all. Southerners re-pluralize to all y'all. <laughs> we can live with this. We can figure it out. You want to know the body count for dinner? Ask. <clears throat> I'd like to apologize for referring to you as you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Should have said everyone. <laughs> we all slip into these forms. Somebody tells you what their pronoun is, you're going to make a mistake from time to time. The problem is not the casual mistake. The problem is when you do intentionally ignore what they want you to say, what they want you to call them, what they want the title. You know, um, whether there's a, there was a sitcom back in the 70s or 80s where, where, where uh, the, the, the main character was Ms. So-and-so, and one of the other regular characters on the show would, would make fun of her by calling her MS such, such and such. Uh, okay, I mean, that, that was for comic effect, but, but you can do it intentionally and create a kind of hostile environment, and that, that's not such a good thing. I think we'll, we'll do this question, and then CJ, if you don't mind, I, I would like to ask the last question. Okay. Um, this now takes me to when I used to do a lot of uh, workshops on diversity, and uh, there would be people, white people, I had people of all different ethnicities, and uh, the white people would say, well, you know, the people, the, those people of color, they just can't decide what they want to be called, you know? And so we'd get into a conversation about that. I'd say, well, why don't, just what you said, why don't you ask, if I ask, if your name is Joe, and, you, and I call you Joseph, and you tell me you want to be called Joe, then I, ignoring a relationship with you. Mm -hmm. So it, sh it shuts down relationships mm -hmm. if I don't ask what people want, and then I can do what they say. I can you know, refer to them how they want to be. Yeah. Communication is very often two-way, and so there is an opportunity to, to correct somebody or to ask somebody, and you know, there are very few situations where, you know, uh, conversation is discouraged, you know, like uh, nobody move and nobody's going to get hurt. Uh, that, th you probably don't want to, you know, raise your hand at that point and say, but wait a minute. 
What do you mean by nobody? Uh, <laughs> but, but in most social situations, we interact. Right. And so that's what I'm asking. Isn't that a way to help build relationship Absolutely. across difference? Absolutely. Okay, good. Thank you. You, singular, are correct. <laughs> So I would like to know, we, we talked about this before the event, and I found it fascinating. Um, the last 50 pages of the book, you go through a, a list of pronouns that have been proposed, meticulously researched, how they were used, where they originated from. What was the origin of the pronoun she? We don't know. That's one pronoun whose origins are masked in the mists of time. We don't quite know where she came from. Uh, we know where they came from. They is not original to Old English. They, they appears in the English language late. And, and so does she, in fact. The original Old English pronouns all began with H, hey, heyo, and hit. They all started to sound alike creating an ambiguity. The singular and the plural sounded alike. The masculine, feminine, and neuter sounded alike. The situation was ripe for some kind of disambiguation, some kind of way out of the, uh, the forest here. And, and so we get they, them, and their, which, which were borrowed by old English speakers from the Viking raiders. Now, you have to really need a word if you borrow it from the language of your conquerors. <laughs> and she appears around that time, too. I think it starts in the south of England, makes its way north, but we're not really sure how, how she developed. But it, she spread because obviously there was a need for a distinctly feminine pronoun at, at the time. And you know, he and she are not going away, even with, with the rise of singular they and coin pronouns and people who avoid pronouns altogether. Uh, the masculine and feminine pronouns are not under threat. So if, 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 if you're worried about you know, prying pronouns from your cold, dead fingers, that's, that's, that's not going to happen. I have, I have a friend, you know, this might be a good anecdote, to close on, uh, I have a friend, Jeff Nunberg, who does the um, language commentary on Terry Gross's show on NPR. And he did a, a, a segment on singular they um, a, a month or two ago. And he got an email from an angry listener. We all get emails. Uh, and he sent it to me. He said, here, you can use this. And uh, the guy basically says, First, they come for your pronouns, and then they're going to come for the rest of your freedom of speech. <laughs> I don't think you need to worry about that. <laughs> My advice to this guy, which I did not engage him at all, would be to get a life, <laughs> move on. It, it, it's not the problem that people are sort of creating. Right. Let's thank Dennis Barron. Thank you, CJ. Thank you. And let's go out there and disambiguate. <laughs>